Inflation has been a persistent robbery of the human species from government, from dictators, from counterfeiters. That's what they are. But mostly government because you just simply can't counterfeit enough to steal from the masses without using a centralized body like the government. But it's been a constant for hundreds of years at this point. It's the big thing that got me into Bitcoin. Or you could say that like really orange pilled me is when I understood inflation and Michael Saylor, I always go back to him, giving him him credit because he puts it so perfectly, so succinctly and like everything else, inflation is one of those things that has become so normalized because there's an incentive for people to not question it or to even think it's good for an economy. A lot of modern day fiat economists literally say we should have inflation and we'll justify it. Inflation is the robbery of the buying power, power of the wealth of the masses of humanity in the case of us dollar, because we print the world it's reserve currency and everybody in the world wants dollars because it's the strongest currency. So we export our inflation to everybody else. The poor and the lower and middle classes are always hurt more than the higher classes. In some cases, if you're an asset owner, you actually benefit from inflation. Besides that though, here's the core thing to, to really think about here. That's so crazy. A lot of this dogma and propaganda, at this point, propaganda around owning stocks, it's something that I've been kind of going through. I've gone through a lot of different iterations of my, like how I feel about the stock market. And I generally still like and kind of subscribe to Warren Buffett's, uh, you could say investing philosophy where you have a few eggs and you watch them very closely. And the fact that over time, really good companies are going to beat averages and provide good returns. But what you're seeing though, is you're not seeing that. You're seeing the average investor being told to invest in the index, the entire stock market, right? Of hundreds or thousands of companies. And then I guess in the case of S&P 500, it would be 500 companies. <laughs> but, and then it's like, where's the factoring of inflation, of taxes, of anything else? So here, let me just back up a second. Let's try to collect my thoughts here. And then I'll explain what my strategy is, my long-term investing strategy and how I think about that. But the real thing here that I've evolved from recently is this idea that you just buy an index and you shouldn't buy individual stocks, this and that, because you're not going to beat Wall Street, blah, blah, blah. And I agree with that, but there's a couple problems with that. And there's also a couple nuanced ways to think about it. And that's what I want to talk about right now. Okay. So if you buy the S&P index, that's returned about 7% on average over, you know, hundred plus years or whatever it is, 7%. Okay. And then if you dig a little bit deeper into inflation and the average inflation rate, the real true inflation rate, not what they put in the CPI where they remove energy and food so that the numbers can look better. Can you believe that? It's an inflation rate. It's a basket of goods that they set, but they remove energy and food, which are like the two most important things for human life. If prices of energy and food are going up, but the prices of other things aren't going up as much. What the hell is the difference? <laughs> it's like, it just drives me nuts, man. And people buy this shit. Like really smart people buy this shit, fall for it. <sighs> so the actual true inflation rate is probably even higher than 7%, but it's 7% or so. If you look a little bit closer and potentially maybe even more 10%. I mean, you look at the purchasing power of the dollar, how it's lost 99% of its purchasing power. Same thing with uh, the British pound. 99% of its purchasing power has been eroded over the past 50 to 100 years in each case. 99%. If you live 100 years old and you held the dollars, right? And a lot of people earn dollars or whatever. And, you know, I guess that's a little bit different because earnings sometimes will track with inflation, but... Not really, actually. You would lose 99% of your wealth. 99%. It's absolutely mind-boggling that today that is normalized. Nobody is up in arms about it. It's absolutely batshit crazy. Which is why, like, Bitcoin is the freaking most important damn thing on the planet Earth right now, I think. Okay? But the two things here. If the average S&P return is 7%, if you bought the index and you didn't touch it, 7%. And 
and inflation is around 7%, maybe even higher. That means that your investments are breaking even if you're an index investor. And if you're lucky, you might make a little bit. And if you're not so lucky or average or even slightly below average, you're probably losing a little bit, which I actually believe is the case for most people. The whole buy the index and just compound interest and then you're going to be wealthy or whatever. I mean, like compounding is different. And like, for sure, if you keep adding to your portfolio and keep buying over time, you probably will do okay. You'll probably make a little bit of money, but a little bit of money, right? Who wants to be a millionaire in 30 years when a million dollars is the same as like having a hundred thousand today? It's, it's, it's just crazy. It's absolutely crazy. This shit is so normalized. And then there's actually this good video that was related to this post by, it was Martin Scarelli answering a commenter. The commenter had asked, what do you think the average person should do if they don't know much about stocks, the market, whatever? He said, I prescribe to, uh, what's his name? PayPal co-founder, Peter Thiel's kind of like idea. Like what's that thing that you believe that most people think is crazy? And like kind of like, what is that for you? Because there's probably some truth or some, some value there or some power there. And Scarelli referenced that and then said that I believe the stock market doesn't go up over time. It's funny because he's a hedge fund manager. He was, and he invests in pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. His advice was that most people should not deal with the stock market. They should not even invest in it, even think about it. Because you're going to lose the Wall Street, you're going to lose inflation, you're going to lose the corporate taxes. And if you look at history, empires over time fail. We think that because the stock market's been around for 100 years, it's going to be around for another 100 years. It could literally implode tomorrow. The United States government could collapse tomorrow. And so I thought about that a second. I'm like, damn, I think I've already been kind of suspecting that because I'm not buying indexes myself, even though I keep hearing people talk about them. What I am actually buying, when I am buying stocks, I'm not buying a whole lot of them, but I'm buying like five companies, most of which that I perceive are monopolies. A lot of times they're tech monopolies because the power of a monopoly is just like you have an advantage. And if, any, and if anything is going to beat inflation, it's going to be a tech monopoly. That's what I would assume, right? And then the rest, I buy Bitcoin. And then the rest, I invest in my own businesses because I can control those investments. So for things that I don't control, it's heavily weighted to Bitcoin. A little bit weighted to, to some of these specific monopoly-based stocks. And then the rest is money that I take into my companies and I convert into profits. And then, you know, I used to grow and get more customers, et cetera. And that's my strategy. And I think for most people, you have to do, I mean, in fact, for most people, that strategy is probably good enough. Maybe weight a little bit more towards Bitcoin. Like you don't know what my weight is, but it's like, I mean, it's probably 80% of my wealth that doesn't go into something else is in Bitcoin. A little bit in real estate, a little bit in stocks. Most of it's in Bitcoin. And then the, I mean, the majority of my wealth, I don't really call it like wealth. It's not because it's not liquid, but it's like my businesses that generate income. So that's a little bit different. But I think most people, you should either, you know, have a business and like use your skills, blood, sweat, and tears to, to make money. Ideally more than 7% uh, a year on average, which in most cases you probably, pr probably are, right? Or you should have a job and every extra damn penny that you can possibly get converted into Bitcoin. And then maybe a few tech monopolies if you want to. And, and that is the strategy that I think is going to be wealth in the 21st, the future of the century. It's not buy the S&P, buy the stock market that's booming after World War II, like in the case of Warren Buffett, and then just hold it forever and you'll become a billionaire. I mean, that might still work, but I don't know, man. I mean... There's no signs that the government is going to stop printing. There's no signs the government is going to stop going into debt. There's no signs that the global economy is going to go in a better direction. It's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And governments are going to spend more and more and more. And then over time, it will be too much. And there will be some cataclysmic collapse. One thing's for sure. They can't touch my Bitcoin. They can't print more of it. They can't take it away from anybody. I mean, aside from like, a wrench and you give them their seed phrase. But for the most part, Bitcoin is the hardest money. It's the most secure asset, pretty much the only asset that you can actually own in the history of our species. It's, it's, it's amazing. And it's going to change the world. When it becomes ubiquitous enough that all 
seven, eight billion humans have a little bit of Bitcoin. They understand how to use it. It's going to bring so many checks and balances to governments, to states, to money printing. It's, I mean, even just human interaction, like it's going to disincentivize war. It's incredible. This thing, this discovery of absolute scarcity. Incredible. So that's just a short video on some thoughts on the stock market. If you're just buying the index, not doing much else, you know, you're working nine to five, you get taxed on your wages. When you spend money, you get taxed. When you die, you get taxed. When you gift, you get taxed, so on and so forth. The state taxes as a parasite off as much value as it can so that it can make the, you could say, incumbents or the operators of the state wealthy and gaining power, maintaining power, et cetera while the masses and the productive members of society support all that nonsense. It's, it's, it's actually insane that we have these groups of people that form this thing called a state or a government, and they actually don't, for the most part, have any accountability to anything. And they can break the law to, to, as whatever, as much as they want, as long as they have the right friends in the right places. And they got to take money from us, from the economy, from the world. They take it through taxes. They take it through inflation. And it's like, that's just normal. And we just accept it. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. And if you spent any time learning anything about libertarianism or anarchism or anarcho-capitalism or money or pff, just like morality, you realize that the state is an abomination and there's nothing natural about it. It's just this period of time in history in 2023, this is where we are. And I think in a couple hundred years, we're gonna look back at this time, just like we look back on World War I, World War II, and the 1800s and 1700s and all that stuff. Like We're gonna look back at this time as that, that really costly, expensive experiment known as quote unquote democracy that people thought was freedom, quote unquote, and actually was just a, I would say, you could say the least parasitic bane on humanity. It was, less parasitic than communism and, and socialism, though it's actually sliding into socialism, so that ends up being the same thing over the long run. <laughs> yeah, it's just wild, man. It's absolutely wild. And like, like when I first got into Bitcoin, I wanted to shout it from the rooftops. I wanted to help as many people as possible. And then, and then I was like, you know, that's not really gonna generate enough financial energy or really any, unless I really focus on it. So I need to get back to what I'm good at. I know how to generate profits by providing value in the marketplace. That's what I got to focus on because that's what's going to bring me the most financial wealth for myself and my family that I can then use to buy back my time, get security, get all those things. And then, you know, later on I can make investments in people and companies and things and ideas and movements that can change the world. Um, and just be patient because something like Bitcoin, it's going to take time. It's going to take time to, for everyone to get it, to see it. But when they do, oh my God, everything's changed. So, I, w I would say that if you aren't already buying Bitcoin, at least as some part of your strategy, you're, I mean, you're going to be left behind. It's as simple as that. And you're going to really, really regret it. Do not regret it that way. Because regretting it might be the difference between like having all of your wealth stolen in front of your face or losing it overnight or being secure for the rest of your life and your family's life and generations to come. Right? Like, are you willing to take that risk because you don't want to study a little bit, learn something that you don't understand? Right? It's crazy. It's incredible.